Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Uh, As you do, let's pray. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit would open our ears to hear your word and fill our minds and hearts with the life that it brings so that, like Jesus, our labor might not be in vain. Amen. I thought I'd pick an Old Testament 2 set text, uh, except it's New Testament 2. Um, and I've chosen the last chapter, but we can't really afford to ignore the first 15. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you just read the last page of a novel, you might take a stab at what the story was about, but without actually experiencing the story, the ending's going to just leave you flat, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 tells us how to live for Jesus. But it actually takes the first 15 chapters to empower us to live for Jesus. So here's my original artwork of the whole book. You like it? (laughs) It starts with the death of Jesus. The cross shows us that God exercises his power through weakness. And the Corinthians needed to know that God values weak people who trust in him. The middle of the book is mainly about bodies, right? Your body belongs to Jesus. He bought it with his life. So you can't do whatever you like with your body because your body matters. And the most important thing about your body is that it's part of a bigger body, right? the body of Christ. And what Jesus did for us on the cross sets us free to use our bodies to help other people become more like him. Then chapter 15 shows us the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus walked a path of suffering and death, but it led to glory. And it showed once and for all that God's foolishness is wiser than any human wisdom. It's a great journey. I love 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15 is the most spectacular point. It's like this lookout where we get to see all the way to the new creation. And uh, an amazing view is exactly the right place to end a journey in a movie. Right, but a journey in real life, you've got to get back home again and get on with living. And that's exactly how chapter 15 ends. You've seen this vision of what lies ahead. Now it's time to come down the mountain and get to work. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And the work of the Lord is basically what the whole book is about. Proclaiming Christ crucified as the power of God and the wisdom of God. Um, Entrusting yourselves to God in your weakness. Honoring him with your bodies, building each other up um, in love. Because the person you become through following Christ in this life and the person you help somebody else to become by pointing them to Christ and building them up in him, those people will last forever, perfected and glorious. And that's the work of the Lord. So the question then that we have in our minds as we come to chapter 16 is, well, what exactly does that look like, doing the work of the Lord? And chapter 16 gives us a snapshot. It's got two main sections, and the work of the Lord features in both of them. First in verse 10. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he's with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. Then again in verse 16, submit to such people, he's talking about the household of Stephanas, and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. So what I want to do today is reflect on the work of the Lord and partnership. That's today, and next Tuesday I want us to think in the second half of this chapter about the work of the Lord and love. So that's where we're going. First of all, however, I've got a question for you. Um, We don't have time to talk. We can just think about it. Um, Participation was for last night. (laughs) When you were a kid, primary school or high school, what was the best thing you ever made with your mum or your dad or some other adult? For me, it was a weatherboard hut that I helped my uncle build on his property when I was 50. Now, I couldn't find a photo, so here's a much bigger house and much smaller kids I found on the internet. 
There you go, the picture, right? At the end of each day, I was completely worn out. But how satisfying was that tiredness? You know, it was the weariness of accomplishment. Now, my actual contribution was embarrassingly close to zero, but I still felt that hut was partially mine. Now, I don't have photos of my hut, but I do have photos of what I reckon was the best thing my brother made with our dad. They made a musical about Abraham. Welcome to the 80s. <laughs> my dad wrote the lyrics. My brother wrote the music. Our church staged it alongside a sermon series on Genesis. Now, making a musical is a very different type of work from building a hut. Right? My dad would give my brother some lyrics. He'd have to work out how to fit music to them. Sometimes my father would adapt lyrics to make the job easier, and eventually the musical took shape. It's like learning to dance. A child might start out by dancing on her dad's feet and learn to respond to his movements or maybe do it more conventionally. But either way, if you want to build something great, say a musical or a dance performance, then the hours of work you put in are about observing and responding. In other words, they are about partnership. So that's the picture I want us to have today as we leave. Doing the work of the Lord is like a child dancing to her father's feet. And it's hard work, and it is deeply, deeply satisfying. And it's called partnership. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. So the people that Paul is collecting money for are Christians way off in Jerusalem, and they've been suffering from a famine. And Paul wants the Corinthians to lift their eyes beyond their own city and see that God's work spans the world. Because when Jesus returns, every knee will bow to him. And we've been invited to partner with our risen Lord in that amazing mission, right? Building something that as large as all of space and time. This is the best thing we will ever make. So we need to treat the work as seriously as any work we've ever done, don't we? Look at verse 2, on the first day of every week. Before you spend that money on anything else, prioritize this. You want to give generously? Plan ahead. Calculate installments. Prepare for the day the money needs to be ready because this is a partnership with God. The thing that makes partnership with God so special, I think, is hidden in that word income. Give in keeping with your income. Uh, It was a bit different back in those days. Uh, Income wasn't money your employer put in your account. It was money that came from things that grew when there was enough rain, right? Money that you only had because God made you prosper. So the gift of generosity, it's a gift God gives us the same way a parent gives their child money to donate to charity. Partners with God dance to his feet. He puts us in a position to help build something that's going to last forever. Amazing. And it seems kind of inefficient, right? Like God could easily have given money directly to the people who needed it. But that's not God's way. He loves to give us the deep satisfaction of building his hut with him, of writing his musical with him. And even though it's all his work, He expects us to plan, to take ownership, to make it ours as well. Now, it's not until 2 Corinthians that Paul speaks directly about generosity, but I think what he will say there grows out of what he says here. Because if God is the one who supplies you with your income, you shouldn't be afraid to be generous. When your father puts money into your hand and you've thankfully bought your daily bread, and there's money left over. 
That's an invitation to partnership, isn't it? To build something together. So let me encourage you, don't be afraid to go for broke. And I think this can sometimes be a conscience issue for people in ministry who rely on the generosity of others. So maybe more specifically, let me assure you, you don't have to be afraid of being generous with resources other people give you to support your ministry. Remember that God gives things to the wrong people on purpose. Huh? Sometimes it's just a few dollars. Because the amount doesn't matter. It's about the joy of partnership with our Heavenly Father, of learning to discern where his feet are moving and moving ours with him. And we partner with God in weakness precisely because God is strong. Well, doing the work of the Lord is not only about partnering with God. Of course, it's uh, about partnering with one another as well. And so Paul goes on to share some of his own plans with the Corinthians. And I don't think it's just because he wants them to let them know what he's planning. I don't think that would have made it into the Bible. Uh, it's to teach them about partnership. Right? Verse 5. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. I like the way Paul doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. Now, there are lots of variables, things that make him say, perhaps, uh, and I hope. The one thing he does know, of course, is that his future is controlled by God. Right? If the Lord permits, he says in verse 7. But God expects Paul to read the situation and to make plans. And one of Paul's plans is to get back to Corinth. And, and a big reason for that, right in the middle there, is in verse 6. Right? So that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. Because Paul doesn't do the work of the Lord solo. He is carried on his journey by God and the church. God and the church. Now, there are other churches who could have helped Paul, who did help Paul, but Paul wants the Corinthians to join him. I'm really, I'm really interested by the end of verse 9. Uh, it's quite intriguing. And there are many who oppose me. Um, now, some versions translate the conjunction, uh, but as Wallace permits. Um, maybe Paul is saying that there are great opportunities, but the level of opposition is a problem. Right? The outcome, maybe it's uncertain. Um, but I don't like that. That doesn't sound like the Paul we know. I reckon the levels of hostility he was getting made him think, hey, people are reacting to the gospel. That's a good sign. You know, for sure there are times when a wise person walks away from gospel rejection. But Paul's calling as an apostle drew him constantly into hostility and danger. Back in chapter 4, he gave the Corinthians a glimpse into the hardships of an apostle's life. But as we'll see next week, Paul did not expect every Christian in Corinth to be faithful in that same dramatic way. What he did expect was that every Christian in Corinth would help him. And here's the thing. Helping Paul is a way of going with him. If there was ever a church that needed their heads lifted up from their internal problems, their sense of self-sufficiency to see the bigger picture, uh, it was the Corinthians, right? I mean, Paul's invitation to partnership, I think, was a way of showing the Corinthians that the work of the Spirit in joining them all into one body was a work in progress it was a work that would be complete, not just when their bodies were raised incorruptible, but when they were joined into the one great body of worshippers from every nation. Don't know about you, but I sometimes worry that we're losing our grip on this truth in our churches here in Sydney. I think it's especially obvious in 5M churches where too often the mission M doesn't mean global mission anymore, 
just means local evangelism to grow numbers. But it's, I'm not just blaming that model. It's just as much a problem in other churches. You know, we feel beleaguered by a hostile society and we turn inwards to focus on local mission and survival. Paul is reminding us here, I think, to, to, that we partner with God in weakness because God is strong, but also that we partner with one another globally because God's mission is universal. So, we partner with God in weakness. We partner with one another globally. Finally, we partner in person. We partner in person. Now, Paul is writing about a collection of money, but he doesn't think that financial partnership can ever replace partnership in person. Verse 3, he sends people along with the money. Verse 6, he wants to spend real time with them, not just get their assistance to move on. And then in verse 10, he plans to send Timothy to them along with this letter he's been writing. Verse 10, when Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I'm expecting him along with the brothers. Now, the, the, the letter, as we well know, has some pretty hard words in it. And Timothy is going along to vouch personally for those words. So Paul wants them to receive Timothy not just as Paul's mouthpiece, but as God's own partner in delivering some tough love to the church and holding them accountable. I could do a whole sermon on these verses, but I've just got one set of thoughts I want to explore out of this, and that is, um, what do our partnerships look like? What are your partnerships look like? For example, as an individual supporting an IFES worker uh, or as a church supporting a missionary. You know, no doubt you pray when you get an email update. Maybe there are people for whom you set up a direct debit arrangement. But partnership in person, it's got to mean more than that, right? We're going to hear some prayer points from our resident missionaries, uh, Mal and Carissa, a bit later this morning. Uh, and I was turning to Carissa yesterday, and she talked about how encouraging it was for her when people sent a text to ask what to pray for, but especially to let her know that they had prayed, right? Um, actually visiting your missionary in person, I think, is a bit tricky. Um, Middle-class missionary tourism wastes money and burdens missionaries. It's true. But a visit from a church representative, I think, can be incredibly valuable, creating accountability, deepening connections in both directions. Um, here are three tests of partnership. I'm just going to name them, not expand on them because uh, of time. Uh, partnership that's properly personal, right? Number one, does your church think about the work of its missionaries not as their work, but as our work, right? Number two, are you involved enough in their lives that you know when it's time for comforting words and when it's time for hard words? And number three, does your partnership create more missionaries? That's like the final test for me, the acid test. Right? Paul shares his plan because he wants to teach the Corinthians about partnership. Right? He wants them to put their feet to his feet and do the missionary dance with him. And I want to encourage you to think about partnership as practice. Right? What have you learned about the work of the Lord from your partnerships? What have you learned as you've watched somebody that you've prayed for and talked to and communicated with, have you, as you watched them dream gospel dreams and make plans and suffer setbacks and endure with patience and grow in love? You know, one of my favorite things about college is not actually uh, the college review. It's the phenomenon of the sus group. Ah, a bunch of people meeting regularly to suss out somewhere in the world that needs to know Jesus. Uh, they pray for that place. They research it. They seek out Christians and gospel workers from that place to pray for them. And sure enough, as the bonds with that place strengthen, 
one or two of that group start to get sucked in, right? Uh, they feel drawn in personally and they make plans to go. Can you think of anything better to do in your church than build partnership in mission with some sus groups? Well, as we finish, um, I want to just remind us of the vision of Christ in the whole letter. Uh, his journey from death to resurrection, a journey that creates a body and equips it to do the work of the Lord, not as isolated individuals, but as partners who dance to God's feet together. And as we remember the work of Christ our Lord, let me finish in prayer. <clears throat> God our Father, in the name of Christ who died, teach us to partner with you in our weakness, knowing that you are strong. In the name of Christ who is risen, teach us to partner together in person, in the power of the Spirit by whom you join us to one another in love. In the name of the Christ who will come again, Teach us to partner with one another globally, drawn up into your universal mission until all creation bows at the feet of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.